Insidious The Last Key dropped in theaters January 5th, 2017, and critics have been bashing it like crazy. I, for one, Good evening. I, for one, enjoyed the movie. Now, don't get me wrong, there was a couple of things wrong with it. Just like every movie, there's no, no, there no movie perfect. And the things that I thought were wrong with it were just kind of technical issues. It was nothing against the plot. The plot was actually really good. Mostly, it was just kind of lighting issues. I just felt the movie was too dark. And by dark, I just felt I couldn't really see shit. But that's how these movies are typically are. I'm Anthony from the Knights of Horror, and today we are going to be reviewing Insidious, The Last Key. Please keep in mind that what I'm about to say from here on out is going to be spoilers to the limit to this movie. So if you have not seen the movie, pause this video, go watch the movie, and then come back and see what I thought of the movie as I will be breaking down and reviewing the movie. If you guys are still here, if you don't care about spoilers or anything, then here we go. Insidious The Last Key is the fourth installment of the Insidious franchise. Now, we are introduced to a lot of uh, new characters and a lot of new demons in this movie, or ghosts in this movie spirits, so um, let's just break it down from the beginning all the way to the end. We are introduced to a young Elise in the 1950s uh, in a location called, New it's called Five Keys, New Mexico in the 1950s. She grew up in this house which is really haunted because they, they lived up in a penitentiary where patients had died or put on death row to die. So a lot of the spirits are always uh, lingering around the area. You see a small Elise uh, who is probably about 9 or 10 at the time and she already has her gift. We see her drawing in the beginning of the movie but we don't know what she's drawing then it reveals she has been drawing a person who was on death row in the electric chair. We, we know signs that their house uh, is near an, uh, you know, an insane asylum because every time they put someone in the electric chair, uh, their lights start flickering and it kind of scares everybody. We're introduced to her family, her dad named Gerald, her mom, Audrey, and her brother, Christian. These are all new characters to the story and it reveals a little bit more of Elise's backstory. Elise refers to this house as not being her home uh, later on in the movie because she had such bad memories from this house. She sensed that there was a lot of evil in it and a lot of spirits in this uh, house. Um, it is also revealed in the movie that uh, Elise's uh, father is very, very abusive, so she has very abusive background in the movie. This is actually a prequel to, uh, you know it's a prequel for the first two movies because it takes place right before the first two movies. This movie takes place in uh, 2010. So, uh, we see Elise as a little girl and her brother Christian, uh, who is probably like six or seven years old when they show them in the beginning. Um, they go to bed one night because her dad uh, is kind of fed up with her gift. When her dad sends her to bed, he sends her to bed because um, when Christian saw the lights flickering, he said another inmate going to heaven and stuff. And then Elise brought up the fact that no, he was a bad guy. His last words were, go to hell and I could feel his presence around us, which freaked out the dad a little bit more, and the mom, not as freaked out, just told the kids to go to bed, and the dad also sent them off to bed. So, when the mom's putting them down to sleep, we hear that she's talking to Elise saying, you know, your dad doesn't quite get your gift, but I do. I believe that you see all these stuff and everything. I believe you 100%. Let's just keep the gift uh, between me and you and not tell your dad too much because he starts to freak out and everything. And then uh, the little brother uh, is given a whistle from the mom, the mom telling him, hey, you know, if you're ever in trouble or anything, just blow this whistle and I will come to you. Uh, but, you know, make it count because I won't always be there in life. This whistle is going to have a major uh, part in the movie, which I will explain to later on in the video. So Elise and Christian go to bed and finally uh, get down when... In the middle of the night, Elise wakes up and just starts talking to her brother, or who she thinks is her brother. She wakes up her brother who sleeps on the top bunk. They have bunk beds, 
and she starts talking to her brother. Um, the brother replies to her everything she tells him, but we find out that Christian actually is sleeping on a chair next to the bunk beds when Elise opens up her little curtains on the bottom and sees Christian laying on the chair. When she looks up again, she feels freaked out, so she gets out of bed, looks up. We see someone that is under the blankets, but when Elise goes and feels for it, there's no one there. The blanket's flat immediately. But as Elise gets down, we see a little boy run across the screen uh, behind her really quick. And then we see, you know, her the closet's open and stuff, and she eventually starts talking to the spirit. Well, it is revealed that the spirit is actually friendly to her at first, and when I say that, I'll, yeah, I'll get to that later because uh, the spirit is trying to trap her down somewhere to open up something. Uh, this happens. Christian eventually wakes up and sees Elise go towards the closet and start talking to someone and someone talking back. Christian is terrified of this, so then he starts screaming. Her dad, uh, Gerald, and, at, and her mom, Audrey, run upstairs because they hear the screaming. And her dad uh, pretty much asks them what, what happened, what's going on. Um... He comes with uh, this stick that he carries around a lot, and he looks at Elise and tells Elise, are you talking to ghosts? And there are ghosts, you know, did you see a ghost? Elise replies, yes. He kind of gives her another chance to, like, say no, that, you know, everything that she heard was in her head. So he asks her again, uh, did you see a ghost? She replies, yes, again, but starts crying even more. He puts her against the wall and starts beating her with the stick and that's where her abusive background comes from. Her dad used to beat her a lot as a kid and uh, that made her, you know, fed up with, um, you know, living with her dad eventually, which we'll get onto later on in the plot. It is revealed to that, um, that later on in the plot, uh, he sends, or you know, that same night he sends Elise down to the basement where it's kind of creepy down there so she uh, doesn't like to be locked down there. She starts crying. The mom, Audrey, is just devastated and trying to tell uh, the dad to, you know, ease off on her, just leave her alone and stuff. But, you know, it was the 50s, so, like, a lot of the men always controlled over the, the woman. You know, the, the man was the working man, the women were the stay-at-home moms. It was different times then, so they didn't quite uh, see eye-to-eye, -eye, whereas today you can talk stuff out. But she gets locked into this basement where we hear that voice again of the little kid. The little kid brings up the fact that, hey, you know, there's a store that you can open where you can get away from all the reality, all this stuff. And that's where it's revealed that she finds a set of keys where this opens up this secret door. And when she opens up the door, the key, uh, you know, she leaves the key, she gets shocked, she gets back. Then she kind of gets, like, in this trance where it kind of possesses her in a way. And then the key that opened the door was, like, the master key. So we get introduced to the demon who goes by the name of Keyface in here. And Keyface takes that key and adds it to his uh, finger of collection. If you guys haven't seen the promotional for this movie a lot, his, uh, this demon's famous now for having these uh, kind of keys as, uh, on his fingers and stuff. And they all, do sort of, uh, they all do some stuff which they are revealed later on in the plot and I will get to that. But at least does uh, open this door and it reveals uh, Keyface. You only see his hand though as of right now. And she's downstairs being possessed by this demon, who we find out is, you know, Keyface. He's trying to get something out of her because she's really powerful. And then uh, her mom, Audrey, actually runs downstairs and kind of tries to help her. But we do see a wire wrapped around her neck and ends up hanging her. Uh, and the mom ends up dying, or so we think. The dad, Gerald, comes running downstairs and finds Audrey on the floor with the mark around her neck that she just got hung. And Elise snaps out of it and turns around and goes, oh my god, did I just, I, I did this, I killed her and stuff. It was later revealed that Elise had just had a nightmare and she has these reoccurring nightmares of her childhood because her dad abused her and it's kind of a scar for life in her. It is typically known that Elise has nightmares of places that she has to go to for work. Usually occur the night before and then she wakes up, usually gets a phone call or the next day she gets a phone call of some sort. So we see that later on in the day, um... Uh, Tucker and Specs, they live with her, so, uh, you know, Tucker is just the comic relief of this whole movie. He tries to put up this new uh, device he created with, like, uh, you don't have to use a light switch no more to turn on the lights, you just say the word. Of course, this experiment fails, and he gets mad and stuff, and all that. So, they do receive a phone call about a haunted house in her old house, where she finds out in uh, Five Keys, New Mexico. 
she gets a little scarred over the phone. She tells the guy, I can't help you because, uh, you know, I've, I used to live there and I have bad memories from there, so I just can't help you from here on out. So she hangs up the phone. Later on that night, she grabs Tucker and Specs and they go down in the dining room where she explains to them why she denied the job, but kind of changes her mind towards the end saying that I have to help this guy. I know what he's going through. I went through the same exact thing. And I think I might be the only one that could stop this. So, ideally, um, she tells Tucker and Specs, I have to do this one alone. But between Tucker and Specs, they kind of look at each other like, no, nah, you're not going to do this alone. We're going to come with you. So Tucker and Specs go all out and buy an RV. Uh, and they paint their logo on the side of it, saying that they bought the RV for 700 bucks and it cost them $200 to do that paint job. So they have no choice but to come now. So... Elise kind of smiles, saying that, kind of like a relief that they are coming because she needs their help, and in the end, because they help out a lot. So they go down to her old place in uh, Five Keys, New Mexico, and we are revealed that it is owned by a new owner. This new owner goes by the name of Ted Garza. Now, Ted Garza is the new owner of this house, and he's pretty much kept the house the way it is. He said when he moved into the house that a lot of the furniture was there and he, he said it was a lot of good furniture not to waste so he just decided to m make a few uh, adjustments and uh, the place was his. He then goes on to say that he then goes on to say that he's been hearing a lot of stuff coming in from one room in particular and that is Elisa's old room but he has it guarded up with a bunch of Bibles and stuff and he said he refuses to step foot in this room. He then ex uh, explains to Elise that he needs this ghost out of here because he put his entire life savings into this house. Elise agrees to help the guy out, but um, wants to stay the night in her old room overnight and um, wants to see what she finds. She then goes around to the house and um, starts uh, revealing a lot of stuff in her past. Um, we finally, uh, she starts hearing a voice saying, come and help her a lot. It leads her back down to the basement, which we see uh, kind of scars her again. She uh, then reviews the footage from last night and uh, knows what she has to do tonight. This time, Tucker stays with her, and they uh, end up recording sounds in the um, room again, where she does hear that voice again saying, uh, you gotta come help her, which this ghost in this, um, in this movie is a helping ghost, just wants to help and do what they can to uh, erase the evil as well. But before that, uh, the other night, uh, the, the night before that she found uh, the whistle again, they thought they had lost the whistle in the, when they were children forever, but she finds the whistle, and that whistle is another major uh, playing point in this movie. When she goes downstairs, the ghost, uh, also the night before, had taken the whistle um, and took it downstairs. When Tucker and Elise go downstairs, they hear the whistle again, she goes up to the door and she asks the uh, ghost a series of questions, asking her if she's good, uh, does she know something that we don't, does she want us to come through this wall, uh, is there something that we need to see, telling the ghost that whistle means yes, to whistle means no. So uh, all this ghost has been trying to do is help this girl out who's been trapped in Ted's basement in this uh, false wall where it's the same door that Elise saw as a little kid went to the further. But this time we find out that this space that she's in is actually a kind of little prison cell type thing. So Elise walks in, looks around and everything, and we see a girl in the corner just kind of in the fetal position, just kind of, you know, hiding from something. Then Elise looks away and finds the whistle, which then the girl comes up to her and does like a motion like that to her. And then... We finally hear the ghost come out and pop out with another jump scare, which is Sidious' favorite for doing, that says, help her. She yells it out real loud. And then we finally reveal that there has been a girl staying under that um, basement for so long, uh, like a couple months now, and that we find out that Ted is a, a bad guy and has been kidnapping, had kidnapped this girl and kept her held uh, hostage, prisoner, however you want to put it. Well, Ted doesn't like this very much, and Ted comes down with a gun and threatens to kill Tucker and Elise because all he asked them to do was get rid of this ghost. And Elise explains to Ted that the reason why they came down there was because the ghost led him down there. So Specs sees this on the camera. Specs runs in and tries to do what he can. Ted hears Specs on the top, closes the door, traps him inside, 
and Specs uh, is upstairs with the Ted with his gun. Ted goes around the house looking for uh, Specs, and Specs runs around the house. He gets shot at a couple times, and eventually they end up in this room where Ted falls on the floor. Specs' opportunity is to uh, collapse this uh, dresser on top of him, which he does, and ends up killing Ted. Ted is officially dead. They call the cops, and they find. then you find out that the cops have been looking for this girl. She's been missing for months. She got kidnapped by Ted, and uh, they take her to a hospital so she can get better. We then come back to um, them in front of the house during the day. Uh, Elise looks up in the window and sees that girl who helped out. And we kind of think it's all said and done from there. Well, they end up going to this cafe to eat. And it reminds Elise of uh, her childhood living in Five Keys. And she sees these two women. These two women uh, are revealed to be Elise's nieces because uh, they are uh, her brother's children. She looks. She goes up to them. She asks. She looks at them, and she says that uh, they look very familiar and everything. She she feels like she knows them, or you know, has a relation to them. Uh, or Christian walks in. He's a lot older now, just about the same age as uh, Elise. He looks at Elise kind of like with the shock on his face that he hasn't seen her in so long. Because in the plot, it is said that uh, when Elise was a teenager, he got she got so fed up with his dad, uh, with her dad. She got so fed up with her dad that she just kind of walked out. That day, she also saw a lady in the laundry room, and she thought it was a ghost. But I'll get to that later of who that was, and why Elise thought it was a spirit. But she sees this girl in the laundry room, and then the dad checks, and there's no one there. Um, and then he was about to beat Elise again, and Elise had just had enough, so she just ran out and kind of went on to do her own thing because she was tired of being abused. And that actually pissed off Christian because Christian was then left alone to be raised by their abusive father, who he did not like at all as well. So Christian walks into the diner and sees Elise for the first time in I don't know how many years. Um, and he's shocked, but then at the same time he's pissed. He goes up, She goes up to Christian and tries to apologize for leaving him alone for all these years and that she wishes she can change what she did. But Christian is still very pissed off at her, so he just kind of yells at her and says that we're nothing, you're dead to me pretty much, and all that. He grabs his daughters, then we reveal that those are Elise's nieces. Elise kind of finds that out, and Elise also wants to meet them and uh, is interested in seeing who they are and everything. This is the first time that the daughters find out that um, Christian had a sister. The daughter's two names are Emojin and Melissa. I don't know if I'm saying her name right. I might be butchering it. I forgot how they pronounce it in the movie. It is I M O. G E N. So I'm going to just say Emojin. Emojin and Melissa. Emojin and Melissa are uh, happen to be Christian's um, daughters and Elise's nieces. So uh, we see that um, Melissa gives, uh, you know, talks to Elise saying, Hey, I'm sorry. He's usually like that a lot. I didn't know he had a sister and it's very nice to meet you and all that. And Emojin is kind of like the rude, uh, sassy one who you do find out later on is actually has a major role in this movie and um, she's just like Elise um, but Melissa talks to Elise a little bit Elise gives him a still photo of the whistle that Christian had when he was a little kid telling Melissa give this to your father he'll um, he'll be happy once he knows about this Christian and his daughters they go down to that house where they grew up in and he starts telling them like we gotta look for this whistle and stuff so they start looking for the whistle well, Melissa goes down to the basement and she uh, ends up meeting Keyface, who then uh, mutes her voice and starts to uh, take her soul to the further. We see that he does that with uh, different keys. That's why he is known as Keyface. And that gives Elise uh, a vision which she sees in the uh, police station when she's getting interviewed of, the, of Melissa going like that, but her mouth is all like black and her eyes are all black and her face is all pale. She looks pretty scary. It's another jump scare moment. And she knows immediately what happened. So she, then she goes down to um, the house and starts to uh, talk to Christian and uh, Emojin. And they um, talk, uh, telling her, you don't know where Melissa's at, don't you? And he goes, yeah, we've been looking for her for a little bit. And she goes, I know what happened and everything. So they find Melissa's body. They call the paramedics. And so Christian and Melissa go to the hospital 
Emojin was going to come with them, but Emojin says, I'm going to stay back with Elise. I have a feeling I just belong here and stuff. So Christian kind of agrees to it. Then Emojin tells Elise, hey, I'm just like you. I get dreams and then these dreams end up coming true. I have these visions. I'm just like you. And Elise is not, you know, Elise kind of is surprised at the same time, but she's not surprised. She kind of already knew this. So Emojin... Elise, Tucker, and Specs, they go back into the house and they do uh, more of an investigation of what's going on. They're trying to get to Keyface. They're trying to get to the further. They're trying to rescue Melissa's soul. Melissa's in the hospital while all this is happening with uh, Christian. So we see Elise. She uh, she gets caught by Keyface herself as well. And Keyface takes her soul and uh, shuts her, mutes her, and takes her to the further as well. And then... As that's all going down, Tucker and Specs get her body from downstairs and bring it upstairs. Emojin, uh, Tucker and Specs actually are having an argument of saying who's going to go and rescue her. None of us are capable of doing that. Emojin brings out the fact that she's a psychic and that she's going to go in and rescue both Melissa and Elise. So we see the fact that uh, Emojin is actually putting her abilities to the test. And uh, Tucker puts her in a, in a trance and she falls asleep and ends up in the further. She goes into the further and she goes and looks for Elise. We cut to Elise where Elise is trapped in the cell, kind of reliving her worst nightmare of her dad uh, beating her. Keyface then comes in and brings a stick. Her dad puts her hand, puts his hands on the um, wall and repeats stuff like, uh, I deserve this and everything. And uh, with rage, Elise just starts beating uh, and beating uh, Gerald, her dad. So Keyface is kind of uh, getting power from this. He wants to see her rage and stuff. So Keyface... Uh, is actually you know laughing and stuff like that because it's it's giving them more power as they as he beats her more and more. We then go on to see um, uh, Emotion comes in and she uh, sees Elise doing this. She, she tells Elise to stop. Keyface gets mad at the fact that she stops because uh, Elise turns around and pretty much tells Keyface to go. F and uh, he gets mad at this, so then he uh, goes and takes Emotion and he grabs Melissa. Uh, and they end up at the down of the hallway, and Elise now has more control in the further, so she kind of opens the door like with a force push, and then uh, he sees uh, she sees Keyface with the two girls beside him. They're all in like a chain and stuff, and that's kind of a way of saying I'm gonna kill them in front of you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Elise comes down and says, "No, take me instead." So at this moment, we see Keyface jump on top of Elise. He turns her voice to mute, and he's about to take her soul from her once and for all. But uh, Emojin had been blessed to get the, the whistle from, uh, uh, you know, Melissa downstairs and everything. And she had the whistle on her. So then she throws the whistle to Elise Town and to use the whistle because it might help. Elise, uh, reaching for the whistle, uh, does her best to reach for it. When she finally reaches the whistle, she blows it. And that's when a kind of big vibration goes on into the further. We see Elise's mom, Audrey, who we haven't seen since the 50s. And this comes back into full circle when the mom said, when you blow this whistle, I'll be there no matter what. But use it wisely because one day I might not be there. But since her mom is a spirit, uh, we do find out that um, she, you know, she's in the further uh, as a lost soul. Let me back it up a little bit. Um, I brought up the fact that Elise, as a teenager, saw a little girl or saw just a woman in the uh, laundry room. And that's what caused her to leave. We do find out that the dad... Uh, we do find out early on in the movie that the mom never died. Uh, he just wanted her to think that she died, making it think like it was her fault the entire time. When in reality, the dad was keeping the mom locked up downstairs. And uh, we do find out that that wasn't the only girl that he did that to. Therefore, that girl that was helping out Elise uh, early on in the movie, that was that girl, uh, Soul. Uh, she just wanted to help out. And um, we do find out that Gerald killed Audrey. In the end, we see her beating her to death, and we see a flashback when Elise grabs um, Audrey's old dress. So when Audrey comes out of the further, she helps out Elise. She pretty much kills the demon, and they grab the lantern, and then they grab the two girls, and they go home. Then they kind of have a little emotional moment when Elise looks at the mom, and she goes, I don't know what to say. Words can't express of what I can say. The mom hugs her and kind of lets her go because she can't bring the mom back to life. So they go back. Uh, and uh, Melissa's returned back to her body. Mojin and um, Elise are back to their body, and they run down to the hospital. 
everything's good and said and done at the end. Uh, Christian eventually apologizes, saying that, you know, you say that you bring in demons all the time. I think it was my fault the reason why this demon was here and stuff. So he apologizes. Elise and Christian are reunited. Uh, she meets her nieces and everything. So everything's all said and done, and they leave. And then we get that last scene of every Insidious movie that either sets up the next movie or just kind of has you in a cliffhanger of what the hell is going on. That scene is Elise having another nightmare, but this time she's having the nightmare of the first Insidious movie of that family. She finds out that the kid is being possessed by none other than our favorite red-faced demon. And um, it, it, it proves to another jump scare moment that we see um, she sees uh, the little you know, boy Dalton in bed. He's sleeping and stuff, and we see the two parents, they're talking about what's going on. They think it's the house and stuff. But before that, we see any of them, we start to see image of the house. A lot of people, if you're diehard Insidious fans, you know what the house looks like and stuff. Um, we see images of the house. Then we go to Dalton, and he's asleep. And then the camera pans outside of the window, where we just see kind of the outside in a tree. And then the red-faced demon pops up. And then she wakes up from the dream and gets a call from the family. Uh, and she says, I already know what happened. I'm on my way down there right now. And that's what Full Circle, it sets up Insidious 1, so you can go back and watch it. All in all, guys, this movie was really good. Um, I never have been disappointed with the Insidious, Insidious franchise. They've all been good, in my opinion, so I suggest you guys go see it. Don't listen to the critics. I think it was really good. Guys, I know this video was long, but I had to break down this movie, and I had to review it, so... Thanks, guys, for watching. Uh, as far as future Insidious movies goes, with the way this one ended, I don't know if we'll be getting any more. If they want to keep making money, because they usually do, or if they want to just keep giving us scares, uh, Blumhouse will greenlight it and stuff like that. But, guys, thanks for watching uh, this Insidious review. Thanks for watching. I will see you guys in the next video.